Chapter seven, part three, we're going to move on with a little bit more about enzymes. So um, the way enzymes are regulated um, can have to do with a couple of different things. Um, and, and keep in mind, we are, we are talking about bacteria here. Okay. We're talking about microorganisms. Um, so um, I, I have a habit of kind of relating things to the human body, but um, we are talking about microbiology. So we have constituted, I'm sorry, constitutive and regulated enzymes. So you can see in this image here that um, we have constitutive enzymes. And basically what that means is the number of enzymes hanging out that are available, that are there, that are within the cell are constant. They're there whether the substrate is deficient or whether there is a load, an extra abundant of substrate. The constitutive enzymes are, um, are stay constant. They're, they're going to be there in the same numbers regardless of, of however many substrates are there. Regulated enzymes are regulated by um, whether or not there is substrate available. So you can see in this top picture up here that, um, you know, there's a, a few substrates. The yellow is supposed to be the substrate. And then there are, you know, fairly equal amounts. In this picture, it shows equal amounts of enzymes. But if I add a whole bunch more of that substrate, say if a bacteria has a whole bunch of some specific substrate um, available, then that bacteria will, um, will be able to make more of that enzyme. So the enzyme is then induced to um, be made, or in, it's called um, uh, induction of enzymes, I believe is the term off the top of my head. But um, <clears throat> so less substrate, less enzyme, more substrate, more enzyme. Um, and so if, so it's induced. So if there's um, a, an increase in substrate, then the enzymes will be induced to be made. Okay. Um, if we have a whole bunch of enzymes and then suddenly all of our substrate goes away, then the enzyme will be repressed by the bacteria or the microorganism. So, um, and this, this can happen, um, and bacteria are specifically very clever um, with being able to kind of start making things that they've never made before um, as far as enzymes um, and then suppressing them um, as needed. So um, I don't want you to overthink this because I probably spent too much time explaining this particular topic, but uh, constitutive, the enzymes are in constant numbers regardless of how much substrate is available. And a regulated enzyme is regulated based on how much substrate is available. So if there's a little bit of substrate available, then the enzymes um, will uh, be repressed. And if there's a lot of substrate available, then the enzymes will be induced to be made. So, um, am I on the right slide here? Yes. Okay. Um, so regulation of enzyme action, um, activity of enzymes influenced by the cell's environment. So enzymes are going to be influenced based on what's, uh, around what's available, what's the, the, temperature, the pH, the osmotic pressure, um, and changes in the normal conditions, such as temperature, pH, and osmotic pressure, can cause enzymes to be unstable or labile. Okay, remember we had the native state of an enzyme that we talked about already, where the enzyme is in its natural state. It's I think of it as kind of like its healthy state, its working state. And then if the temperature is increased a little bit too much or the pH is, goes one way or the other, um, or the osmotic pressure is not what it's in, his, in its happy state, um, then the enzyme will become unstable or labile. Denaturation or denatured or to denature um, a 
an enzyme is when basically the native shape is distorted in some way. Um, and if you remember, if we go back to, you know, this picture of this enzyme, if this native state if this natural state of the enzyme, the working state of the enzyme is distorted, then this substrate isn't going to fit right in that, in that little hole, right? So, um, if that happens, the enzyme isn't going to be able to work right, or it won't be able to work at all. So um, denaturation prevents the substrate from attaching to the active site. Denaturation, by definition, is the destruction or the distortion of the enzyme. Um, all right, so direct controls of the action of enzymes. So we have um, different ways that the enzyme is um, controlled and in, in whether or not it's going to work the way it should or um, if the enzyme is going to be available to the substrate. So we have competitive inhibition and non-competitive inhibition. So competitive inhibition inhibits the enzyme activity by supplying a molecule that resembles the enzyme's normal substrate. What that means is that um, there is an extra molecule that mimics or um, is like a, 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 uh, a pretend um, substrate uh, and it, that mimic occupies the active site which prevents the actual substrate from binding to the enzyme. So competitive inhibition means basically there's some sort of competition that gets in the way of the substrate um, to or gets in the way not allowing the actual substrate to interact with the enzyme therefore the reaction cannot happen so competitive inhibition a mimic a imposter um, type of molecule that takes the place of the actual substrate in non-competitive inhibition <clears throat> excuse me the enzymes have two binding sites instead of one. Um, one is called the active site and the other is called the regulatory site. And when a molecule binds to the regulatory site, this actually changes the shape of the enzyme because anytime something binds or unbinds to a protein, and remember an enzyme is a protein, anything, anytime something binds or unbinds to a protein, it changes the protein shape. So when something binds to the right, when the molecule binds to the regulatory site, that changes the shape of the enzyme and that slows down the enzymatic activity um, and basically um, doesn't allow it to do its thing, kind of. Um, so we're talking about inhibition. We're talking about inhibiting the action of the enzymes here in both of these examples. So competitive, Inhibition is when there's some sort of mimic or imposter that gets in the way and takes the place of the substrate. And in non-competitive inhibition, there's an extra binding site on that enzyme. And there's a molecule that will come along and binds to that regulatory site, that extra binding site, which then slows down that enzyme's activity, either slows it down or stops it. So competitive and non-competitive. And I think there's a picture here of this, of all of this going on. Um, you can see that here's the regulatory molecule um, that comes on, comes along and binds and kind of um, causes this, this binding site to close up. Okay, so this is when nothing's inhibiting and this is when that regulatory molecule attaches, changes the shape of this enzyme a little bit and keeps that uh, substrate from binding. Competitive inhibition, they, they kind of look the same. They're not the same. This is the substrate that's supposed to attach. This is the imposter. Um, the imposter binds, and now this guy cannot um, bind to the um, enzyme. 
um, enzyme repression or enzyme induction. Um, so basically just know these as um, definitions. Uh, genetic apparatus responsible for replacing enzymes is automatically suppressed. So during suppression, basically the enzyme is suppressed, um, or I'm sorry, repression. Um, enzyme induction is when enzymes are induced or, um, and that happens when there's suitable substrates present. Um, all right, uh, just some illustrations of this. And um, all right, so I'll finish off this part, um, this part three with this little part. So enzyme induction of E. coli. So if a particular strain of E. coli is inoculated into a medium whose principal carbon source is lactose, it will begin to produce the enzyme lactase, which will hydrolyze or break down that disaccharide into its component parts, glucose and galactose. Um, if, a, if the bacterium is subsequently or later on inoculated into a medium containing only sucrose, it will stop making lactase and begin making sucrase, which will break down sucrose. So this is interesting to me. This is where I say these guys are really clever because depending on what they are, what they have available to them, they will either make certain enzymes or stop making certain enzymes um, based on what, um, what, what they can, can use. So they're very resourceful in that, nope, I'm not going to waste my energy making lactase anymore because I don't have lactose to break down. Instead, I'm going to make, um, you know, sucrase because I have sucrose available. So this response enables the organism to utilize a variety of nutrients, and it also prevents the microbe from wasting energy, making enzymes that aren't there, that they don't need. Okay, so we'll stop there, and we'll pick up on, I believe it's part four.